He's number 34 in your program, number one in your hearts. It's Nick Ba <laughs> coming in from Omaha. Had the call last night of Seton Hall and Creighton on FS1. Nick, what did Creighton do so well that enabled them to have such a strong showing? Well, I think the, the start of the game was really the difference. The first five, six minutes of the game, Creighton was able to get out, get in transition, which is where they're at their best, and score with regularity. And then that got the crowd into the game. And when you dig such a big hole, even though Seton Hall kind of chipped back uh, away at that and got kind of back into the game, I just think the start of the game was really the difference. And then, not sure what the deal was, but obviously with Rodriguez not playing after the first five, six minutes, what that happened was now you take away Seton Hall's leading score, and that allows Kyrie Thomas to slide over and focus on Kadeen Carrington. So you're able to take away Carrington, uh, and, and if he isn't able to get in the lane and make plays, they're just going to have a tough time scoring. So I just think it was the combination of the start of the game for Creighton and the fact that Kyrie Thomas could kind of really – focus in and sink his teeth into uh, Kadeen Carrington, which really propelled the Blue Jays last night. It was a double-digit game, but there's multiple layers to this one. Fans are finding out, now Creighton fans know who he is, but Martin Crumple, as conference season's gone around, he looks like the conference's most improved player. We're still waiting for official word on his status. Can you speak to how significant he's been? Oh, he's been he's been amazing. And in coming into this season, one of the biggest and most pressing questions was what was going to happen at that center position with the departure of Justin Patton. And to be honest with you, I think the Creighton staff, they liked Martin Kroppel, but I don't think in a million years they thought that Martin Kroppel would be as productive as he was so far this season. And, and John, when you look at how Creighton plays offensively, they play fast. So you need a big man that can run the floor. Martin Kroppel can really run the floor. Number two is you have oftentimes four different guards or glorified guards, whether it's uh, Hegner or, or Harrell, towing the arc. So when Creighton sets those on-ball screens, you need someone that can roll to the middle of the floor and to the basket to put pressure on the defense, where as a help side defender, you're going, okay, am I staying attached to Marcus Foster on the three-point line? Am I helping on the roll to Martin Crompel? And you have to have a guy that's got the ability to catch, finish some of those lobs to the rim. And Martin Crumpel, his hands and how he's been able to do just that has, has really been uh, a huge for Creighton. And it's what Justin Patton was able to do last year. And, and crumple has been able to uh, pick up right where Justin Patton left off. So within Creighton's kind of the framework of their system, got to have a five man that can run and put pressure on the rim when he's rolling to the basket. And crumple has been able to do both those things. Uh, so he's been amazingly important to what Creighton's done, uh, and his improvement this year has been spectacular. We always talk about Greg McDermott and his offensive machine. It's tough, though, to hold Angel Delgado to single digits in both points and rebounding. What was the defensive approach that worked so well in this game? Well, Hegner drew the assignment for the majority of the contest, and what they were trying to do, John, not to go too X's and O's with you, but they, they were trying to front Angel Delgado, even if he was 15, 16 feet away from the basket. And then they were trying to come with double teams on the catch off of the four men. Sonogo and Enzi aren't great perimeter shooters. sonogo has been knocking a few down lately. And so you saw some of those four men just hanging off their guy, ready to go double Angel Delgado on the catch. And it kind of got him frustrated. And he couldn't settle into a rhythm of being able to catch, gather himself, survey the situation, make a post move, find different guys. So it really was kind of a team effort, the double team, the scrambles out of it. And then also, I mean, Angel Delgado got into foul trouble as well. So he could never get into an extended time where he was on the floor getting into a rhythm. And so I think Creighton's job of double teaming him and then also uh, the fact that Del Delgado couldn't play extended minutes led to a game where Delgado just wasn't his normal productive self. Yeah, and then when he came back in with two fouls, Creighton attacked Delgado, and yeah. there's nothing he could do. Now, let's get to the Seton Hall team. Now they're 15-4, and four, and obviously overreactions can happen last night from the fan base, but where are you at with this Seton Hall team moving forward here? I still love this team. I mean, listen, Creighton got beat by 22 on Saturday in the sky, at Xavier, and the sky was falling. Now here we are 
a couple of days later and <laughs> Creighton wins big and everybody's like, oh, the Blue Jays are great. So it's kind of the nature of conference play. You don't want to ride the waves too much up or down. And this conference is a beast, man. You got seven teams inside the RPI top 40. It feels like every single night you kind of are saying to yourself, boy, that's a big game. That's a big game. So Seton Hall, he, here's the thing. I'd be more worried about them if they were a roster full of freshmen and sophomores with dealing with you know, losing big at Marquette, losing big at Creighton for them to get down. But this is a group, you look at Carrington, Delgado, and Desi Rodriguez, they've played 117 games together at Seton Hall. They've been through a lot as a team. So I don't, I don't worry about them emotionally getting uh, fragile or falling apart. So you take the kind of intangible aspect of it, and I'm not worried about that. And then the tangible aspect of it is it's a really good basketball team. Uh, I really like playing through Delgado. Uh, Carrington, he's more of a natural two guard than a point guard. He's still trying to learn uh, and find his way uh, in picking and choosing his spots, when to score, when to distribute. Uh, But Delgado affords you the opportunity to play through the post as kind of like a point forward at times. And then Miles Powell, uh, he always has to be able to knock down shots to give uh, Desi Rodriguez and Kadeen Carrington some real estate in the interior. I still really like this team. They're really tough. They're senior laden. They're experienced. I'm not worried about the Hall. That said, in talking about the experience that they have, it, does it say something to you that a senior in Rodriguez is still getting sat down on the bench? I mean, you're a former player. Can, can you yeah. speak to last night's scenario? Yeah, it was it was really really a, a, an interesting one to try and figure out. I actually came home last night and rewatched the first five six minutes of the game, and I was watching just Desi Rodriguez. I'm sitting there going, "Okay, was there a a, a poor effort play? Was there was there something there?" He did have a couple of turnovers. Uh, you know, Kyrie Thomas scored on him once, but it wasn't anything that was just egregious and called for him to be sat down. You never know what's happening, maybe in the huddles or behind the scenes, whatever, and you hate to speculate. Uh, there's no doubt, John. I mean, I don't want to sit here and act like uh, last night was totally normal for a senior to be sat down uh, in a big game on the road like that. But uh, I do think Kevin Willard understands the guys he has, their personalities, what maybe they need, even if they don't know what's best for them in the moment. Uh, certainly a message is sent. And I'll tell you right now, if you're Miles Kale, Jordan Walker, whoever, you're sitting there going, oh, my God, coach sat down Desi for the entire game. That's going to make me kind of perk up and go, well, I better make sure I'm taking care of my business. Uh, the, the one thing, John, is that coaches always have to be kind of playing that psychologist role and pushing the right buttons at the right time and when to send a message. And you never know if there was some sort of message sent uh, to Desi Rodriguez and maybe the whole group last night. And there are certain coaches, when they feel comfortable with their team, that they're willing to sacrifice something in the short term for long-term gain. Now, I don't know if that was what the case was last night, uh, but I'd imagine there'd maybe be some some hard to heart conversations between Desi Rodriguez and Kevin Willard to make sure they get on the same page moving forward. I got a feeling Desi's going to play really hard in the next game. And the next game for the Hall is a top 20 showdown with Xavier on Fox Saturday afternoon. Going back to that life coach psychology thing, I feel like a good guy to have like a dad talk with would be Greg McDermott. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, ask Doug about that. It worked for Doug. He scored 3,000 points. There's plenty of, of father-son conversations there. What, what <laughs> I like about Coach McDermott being around him, John, is he, 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 you talk about riding those highs and lows. He's a competitive guy. D- d- don't get it twisted. But he's, he's not going to totally get down in the dumps, start kicking his guys. He stays pretty positive. And over the course of a three-, four-month season – 30, 35 games, you can't have your leader riding the, the, the roller coaster of emotion. So he, he's great. I mean, you've talked to him. He is a, I'm always amazed. There are certain oh, yeah. coaches, it's like once you get inside 60 minutes before tip, it is like, do not talk to me. You know, do, do, do not approach me. Do not talk to me. But Coach McDermott, he's got such a relaxed uh, vibe about him. And I think that kind of spills into the way that Creighton plays. They play with an air of confidence and an air of relaxation that I think you can just uh, directly attribute to Greg McDermott. We're about a third of the way through Big East play. What's your biggest takeaway thus far? Well, I I, I think – The first thing is probably that the league still runs through Villanova. Uh, The one thing we can't ever do is go spoiled to to what dominance and excellence looks like. Although we're accustomed to seeing Nova stay on top, how they're able to reload and keep this this train rolling is is really impressive. I mean, you lose Daryl Reynolds, Chris Hart, Chris uh, uh, 
uh, Josh Hart and Chris Jenkins, you think most teams would say, well, this is going to be a rebuilding year for us. But they've been able to. I'm not so sure they're not better this year. So, I mean, I think the league still runs through Philadelphia. Uh, I feel like they've really asserted themselves and in, in, in their dominance. Uh, and then, you know, you, you look to me after that. To me, there's Villanova and there's a gap. And you look after that, and it seems like night to night, whether it's Creighton, Xavier, uh, Providence, Marquette, Butler, uh, Seton Hall, on any given night, feels like any one of those teams could beat the other one by 15 points. And it's really hard to go on the road and win right now. Uh, and and that's what makes a good league. But this league still runs through Villanova. I, I just I've been so impressed with what Jay Wright's been able to do from a consistency standpoint. Hardest thing to do in our our, our sport is sustain excellence, especially when you're dealing with roster turnover. Uh, Jay Wright's got himself a heck of a ball club this year. And finally, Creighton alumni three point shooting competition. Who <laughs> wins? Not me. I, with, if, if I'm dealing with Kyle Korver and Doug McDermott and Ethan Rogge, I, I'm, uh, if, if I have an opportunity to maybe try and make them laugh or something beforehand, or you know, maybe even uh, try and get them drunk on dollar beer night before, before they go out and shoot, something like that, I'm going to need a little bit of help. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, though, like, you look at Kyle Korver, top five NBA history, three-point field goals made, and within that top five, yeah. he has the highest percentage. Wow. So you could make an argument he's one of the – two, three, four greatest shooters to ever live. But I'm telling you, if we're talking, John, if we're talking just top of the key, we're only shooting 53s, <laughs> Ethan Rogge, yeah. uh, that, that guy, I'm not, I, there's a chance I'd maybe bet on Ethan Rogge if you had a little three-man shootout between Corver, McDermott, and Rogge. I think he just hit another one in Philadelphia. I think he just hit another <laughs> one at the Wells Fargo Center. <laughs> yeah. I think he did a couple years You're ago right. and Rogge bounced right. for dropping. Right. Nick Bob, a host of Game Time on 1620 The Zone, 11 a.m. to 2 Central, middays in Omaha and on Fox Sports throughout the season. Nick, thanks for your time. You're the man, John. Thank you.